Amen. Amen. If you remain standing and turn to Psalms chapter 103. Psalms 103. If you would read with me together there, let's read the first 17 verses. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth my life from destruction, and crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfy thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always child, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. Finally, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto the children's children. Amen? Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm excited this morning to bring the message in place of our pastor who's in Villarica, Georgia. And uh, it's just an awesome time just to, to be up here. I'm Dave Hill, and I approve this message. <laughs> I'm the care pastor here, and I'm honored to bring the message to you. And outside of God, the most important person in my life, if you don't know her, is my wife, Rosie. She's sitting right there. Also, I co pastor the Bearing Fruit class, as Ron said, with Pastor Bob Matthews back in room six at nine o'clock on the first and third Sundays. Contrary to what Bob said recently, last Sunday, he said 6 a.m. in the morning. So I'm not sure why he thought I was going to get up at 6 a.m. to teach a class. He and his lovely wife, Karen. I'm also proud to be Brian Johnson's stepfather. He's somewhere in here in another class uh, for the last 32 years of his life, as well as his wife, Jennifer, our daughter in law. And I have another son, Matthew and Chris. So God put us together in marriage. Rosie and I, he orchestrated it. It was a storybook. I want to talk to you today about the battle is not yours, it's God's. Amen. It's the Lord's. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse 9. And as you turn there, I have some questions to ask you. Have you ever been in a battle before? Have you ever felt like that it's a never-ending battle with no relief in sight? Yeah. A battle is any situation that causes distraction, pain, anxiety, and stress. A situation that puts two or more persons against each other. In sports, they battle with the idea of someone losing and someone winning. Maybe you find yourself in the midst of a battle and it seems like no matter how hard you try to make sense of something, the battle continues to consume you. Here's my point. When you feel like you can't keep going because you're under attack or things are not going well, surrender and obey the one who gave it all. Amen. That song they, said, said, they just sung said, your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness. Would that be you where you can't seem to get a handle on the things that rise up in your life? Maybe it's a broken relationship with an ex trying to raise the children. Maybe it's an absentee father. Maybe you're in a single relationship where you see red flags that stand out more frequently than ever and you're disagreeing. Maybe it's on your job where there's a battle with your boss or your coworkers. No matter how hard you try, as long as you continue to fight these battles, they don't seem to go away. Think about this. When there are battles, 
there will be casualties. You see, when our children see and hear us battling in the home, it has a negative and lasting effect on them. In many cases, they duplicate those attitudes and battle what they heard. It shows up when they're in school, and many of them will continue that same cycle as they become young adults and older. So look at 2 Chronicles 19, where our text, we will see that Jehoshaphat was a godly king who directed the people to serve the Lord. Verse 9 says, and he charged them, saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. You see, since there's a spiritual battle to be fought, there must be a leader. Our commander, our Father God, the Lord Almighty, he is our leader. My next point is no matter what you're going through right now, remember that God is faithful and will be there with you as you go through it. We're in a spiritual battle for the souls of men and women. So my question is, and to you, if you know this, who is the Lord? We call him Father because we are his sons and daughters. We call him Master because we're willing servants to him. We call him God because he's omnipotent. He's all power. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere and every now. He's all knowing. Psalm 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. I wonder, do you know him? We call him Jesus because he's Lord. He died on the cross for you and I to have eternal life. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I wonder, do you know him? He is the Holy Spirit. He indwells in our body of salvation. I wonder, do you know him? You see, when you know him, you understand that the battles that we fight need to be against Satan and not against each other. My next point is, it's the key scripture in Philippians 3.10. It said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Look on your handout that you have there. You'll see Psalm 24. Talking about our God, it says, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath a clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, Selah. When God is blessing you and your family, and when things are going well in the home or on your job, we may not be looking to the Lord as much. And that is when Satan sees a crack in your foundation. Amen. Let me tell you something about the opposition. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1, the next chapter. And it came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them others beside the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. What we see here are enemies and others who hated the Jews in Jerusalem. They didn't like that the people of Judea were flourishing and that the temple was really richly blessed. Let me stop right here. God continues to bless Harvest Baptist Church Blue Springs. And we see people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We see many of you being discipled and reproducing yourself in the lives of others. We see involvement in several communities. We support many missionaries. Believe me, the devil does not like that. He's building up an army of enemies to try to derail us. Sometimes that enemy is our own carnal flesh. Our attitudes can get in the way of ministry. This church is about evangelism, discipleship, missions, about raising up children to be Christian leaders. It's about having a godly home. Look around this church and see there is ministry to do. There are things that you can do by helping us, by signing up today. Just say, I want to be used by God. Point me in the right direction. I want to put my name down for someone to contact me about serving. You'll find that sheet right out there in the lobby on the right when you go out the door. Don't let that go by you. Say, Lord, I want to be in this battle. I want to make sure that I am serving you. Our children need leaders. 
We need help in the sound, the lighting, all, everywhere, safety, hospitality. Here's my next point. Because when you know something, here's how it works. Sometimes it's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness can hold you back. Some of us need to be broken. See, forgiveness is brokenness. Forgiveness is a direct attribute of brokenness. The point is when we allow ourselves to be broken, we understand the virtues of biblical forgiveness. You see, forgiveness then becomes a part of our growing in Christ. Brokenness allows us to be able to see that when we are hurt by others or we hurt them, we understand what Jesus meant when he was dying on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see, when we offer nourishment to our enemies, we will receive a reward. You don't understand, Dave. They hurt me. I understand that. But here's my point, Proverbs 25, 21 and 22. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. You see, when people such as a spouse, a family member, church member, co-worker have offended us, and we biblically forgive, we are responding correctly to God. My point is, responding correctly to God puts us in Jesus' sandals. We walk now in his sandals. He said, Father, forgive them, for we know not what they do, Luke 23. Make it right and forgive. On March 16th of next year, our Fruit of Forgiveness ministry will conduct a one-day conference here at Harvest. Everyone should come. Whether you're going through something or not, you can come and learn to help others. You see, when you and I view the person or persons who have offended us as instruments of God, we shouldn't become offended. Psalm 119, 165 said, Great peace have I that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen. You see, if we allow Satan to ruin our home, our marriage, it will affect the church. It hurts the church. If he can get your children to follow the world, it hurts. Now, let me tell you something. This battle is not yours. It's God's. My next point is our desire should be to be broken we can become broken, but bless. Realize that when we focus on the work of the cross and recognize that Jesus Christ allowed his body to be broken, we must also allow our bodies to be broken, spiritually broken. We become broken and poured out as Jesus Christ did when he sacrificed his life on the cross. The scripture said that his blood and water was poured out. That means that Jesus paid it all. The song said Jesus paid it all, all, to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I don't know if you hear me this morning. You can say amen if you want, but if you're quiet, that means I'm hitting you. Because I want to I wanna pierce your heart. I want to take, take you to the cross so that you can see that, you know what? We're in this battle, but we're not battling each other. We're battling Satan. You see, brokenness is where God strips us of our arrogancy. When we accept that we cannot make it on our own, when what we have is not enough, Brokenness is when God shows us our sin and our character, our failures and our inadequacies, unquote. But it's also in brokenness that we realize his love, his grace, and his mercy. Because when we realize this, we can begin to understand that we ought to live out the eternal purpose of God. You know, recently I had a total knee replacement and I'm still going through therapy. But every day I went there, that lady worked me hard. She, I mean, she killed me. And I asked her, I said, hey, do you have a problem with men? Because you seem to be hurting me. And she just looked at me and smiled and just kept working, kept working. Here's my next point. It takes pain to get better. You have to be willing to go through pain to heal. We as a church are united. And the power of prayer allows us to talk to God, listen to him through his word. As a church, we've done an awesome job of showing love to each other. You know, it's a great feeling when someone is hurting in this body and you put your arms around them and you love on them. First Corinthians chapter 12 makes it clear that when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. My next point is the power of a committed church is one in which its members understand the vision and will make the necessary sacrifices to make the vision a reality. If you look back in Second Chronicles chapter 18, just a couple chapters back, you will see that the kingdoms are divided and Jehoshaphat is in the midst of war and was making a mistake by aligning himself with Ahab, king of Israel, a bad king. Verse 4 in chapter 18, 
Jehoshaphat asked King Ahab if they needed to pray about their next steps, direction from God. Ahab's false prophets, and not God, told Ahab, go up, for God will deliver it unto the king's hand. Here's my next point. Without praying and asking the Lord for guidance, we can make some bad alliances. Be careful in listening to people who claim to speak for God. They may point you wrong. See, when we find ourselves in a battle, we often seek out people to give us advice to please us. Not seeking the Lord first can prime you for failure. You know what? People will be sincere in trying to help you, but so often they're sincerely wrong. Ahab said in 18.7, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. You see that? For he prophesied, he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. You see, when people have negative words to say about others, our church, and God's anointed, you need to move on and not align yourself with them. Here's my next point. It's important that when you make decisions that you bathe them in prayer and ask God what to do, God will answer your prayers. So why is prayer so important to decision making? Go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And look at verse 2. It says, Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. So what was his proper response? Verse 3. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judea. Man, I want to talk to you today. This is for you. You and I must be leaders in our homes. We set the standard. Our wives and our children must see us seeking the Lord, seeing us praying. It's our job. It's getting quiet in here. It's our job to lead your family. But it's your responsibility as a husband and a father or as a single man to see that you and your family are here on Wednesdays and Sunday nights. Jehoshaphat set the example. He got himself ready to seek the Lord. Many of us need to be here tonight at 530 as we go through praises and prayer together and in the word. This is your church. And everyone should come and spend 90 minutes with us on Wednesdays in the Word. I challenge you to come out, because as you grow, we grow. Those men are going to lay out the four goals of discipleship this coming Wednesday. What an awesome time to find out more about discipleship or to improve on what you already know. But look at verse 4. That was a request. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. My next point is, how do you pray in the face of opposition, in the face of trials, in the face of battles? You know, I'm going to tell you about a, a story. And the people in this story is Dave and Rosie Hill. I told you there was a storybook marriage. I told you that God brought it together. But let me tell you something. 18 plus years ago, Rosie and I battled hard over words and emotions. It was the War of Roses. <laughs> Not the War of Rosie, but the War of Roses. Our main issue was we were battling over authority. It was Christian reality TV. You know what? Tough decisions were made because we were going at it. We needed space. And I'm not talking about the house that we were in needing more space because it was a big house already. Four bedrooms, three and a half baths. We needed space. We both loved God. But I was unhappy with the decision making. So I prayed to God. This, I did this. I prayed to God that he would make my wife miserable. <laughs> yes, I did. I asked God to rain on her parade. That's what I said. You know what? It took two godly men to set me down and show me how wrong that was. One of, them, one of them was a guy whom I discipled, who pointed out that, wait, Dave, wait. You never taught me that in discipleship lesson six on prayer, to, to ask God to do that. Let me tell you something. They convicted me. I realized that I was not being the man that God expected me to be. So every day, I would be in that house by myself, and I took David's Psalm 51 on my bad knees, and I prayed it back to God verse by verse. Look on your handout. This is what David said, 
Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from thine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified, even thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in my sin did, sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. And this is what the point is. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. You see, our pastor has been focusing on the life of David. You see, it was 18 plus years ago I determined that I didn't do the things that David did, but God is not a respecter of persons. I was no better than David. I failed in not totally leading my home during that window of time. Let me tell you something. A sin is a sin in God's eyes. Here's my next point. What should you do in tough times? First, you acknowledge God. Look at verse 6, chapter 20. This is Jehoshaphat talking and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest thou not thou over the, all the kings of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? It's also on your handout where it says, Matthew 6, and when thou prayest, pray to thy father. Verse 9, after this manner, our father, which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see, when you first acknowledge him, then you confirm the power of God. Look at verse 7. Art now thou our God, who did drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel? You confirm the power, now you confirm your faith. In verse 9 it says, If when evil cometh upon us as a sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house, and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, we stand means we have faith. If we have faith in God. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So after you confirm the power and you confirm your, your faith, then you plea and cry out to God. And the rest of verse 9 says, And cry unto thee in our affliction, then wilt thou hear and help. Because then we recognize our weakness and the need for God's power and strength. In verse 12, it says, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. This is what you do. You admit that you may not have a plan. The second part of that scripture says, neither know we what to do. Lord, show me what to do. Be open to see his plan where it says, but our eyes are upon thee. That's what it says in that verse, verse 12. You see, they were ready to see God's plan. The next point is, you can't see God's plan if you're bound up in battle. The point is, don't let pride get in the way of you not being, uh, being used by God in his church. Focus on how you can make a difference in your life, your family, and in this church. Let me tell you something. Prayer creates a spirit of unity. Verse 13 of chapter 20. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. Unity. The point is, when we as a church come together in prayer, God hears our hearts and gives us victories. Look at verse 15. Very important verse. This is what he said. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, it's God's. Don't worry about how big the obstacle or enemy is. God's got it. You know, Janet Cross, an awesome Bible teacher here at Harvest, recently said this. We spend our lives fighting a battle that's already been won. Wow. 
It's amazing. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He secured that victory. Satan's goal, the next point, Satan's goal is to destroy the church. And it's on your handout. It talks about self-destruction, the battle for the mind, by self relationship destruction, tearing down marriages and families in the church, by emotional paralysis, battle for your personal relationship with God, being mad at God, why me? Spiritual paralysis, lost ministry opportunities, as well as health issues and the lost mission, being disobedient to the divine appointment that God gives you. This is what you do, verse 16, you listen and respond. He said, tomorrow go you down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jerel. My next point is sit, stand still, and see. Verse 17, you should not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the, of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go against them, for the Lord will be with you. You see, the power of obedience allows us to get out of the way, stand still, and see how God handles our situations. You'll find out in verses 18 to 20 that Jehoshaphat led them in prayer, and the people stood up to praise God with loud voices. They believed. But there's another point I want to say to you as I draw close. Second Chronicles 20, 21, it says, and when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord for our awesome praise ministry. Amen? Amen. They do an awesome job. They prepare our hearts for the word. But what are you singing to God? These, these singers, if you look at that scripture, it says they went out before the army. These singers had no weapons. And their army was outnumbered, but they had confidence in the Lord. Isaiah 54 says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. The song says, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. He promised me that I, I will serve him till I die. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Satan can't do anything that God won't allow. It's my point, when you pray fervently to the Lord, your confidence level is so great that nothing formed against you will keep God's mercy and grace from coming through. You see, when you decide to pray to the Lord with a spirit of boldness and humility and serving, stand back and watch the Lord work. Verse 22, and when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. And when Judah came forward the watchtower, toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, here it is. There were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. You see, you find that God gave them the victory without them lifting one hand to fight. He gave them so much riches and jewels that it took three days, the scripture says, for them to accumulate all of it. You see, God will bless your sacrifice, your faith, and commitment. He will give you more than you ever asked for. 29. And the fear of God was upon all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel. Our God is an awesome God. You see, whatever your concern is in your home, your job, your marriage, relationship, your family, give it to God. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Let him fight your battles. You see, when we pray to church, we show God that we're thankful for what he's done for us. You and I will be challenged because we serve the one and only true Savior. God is our refuge and our strength. Put your trust in him no matter what the situation is. Have faith that he will provide victory and will give you more than you need. My point is, the battle is not yours. It's God's. Amen? I'm going to ask the praise team to come up as we prepare for the invitation. And I want to take this time to offer each of you an opportunity to receive a relationship with Jesus Christ the Lord. Maybe you don't know him as your Lord and Savior. It might be that you never understood what it meant to be saved. Jesus Christ is calling you to accept him by confessing your sins and asking the Holy Spirit to take up residency in your body. 
The scripture says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Yeah. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You ask the question, will I sin after getting saved? Yes, you will. But you will see a change in your heart and mind that your desire to sin will become less and less. Maybe you need to come to the altar today and pray and begin a new walk with the Lord. Psalm 27 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came up against me to eat upon my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host shall encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war shall rise against me in, my, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. It says, teach me thy way, O God, and lead me in thy plain path because of my enemies. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You see, God will remove your obstacles, whatever and whoever, out of the way. They're going to start singing the song, and I'll read the scripture as they're singing the song, because it's going to be awesome for you to understand. If you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I challenge you to come forward. You can come forward after the song, or you can come forward at any time. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. God is our refuge and our strength, Psalm 46, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled. Though the mountains shake with the swelling there of Selah, there is a river, the stream whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of, our, of Jacob, our refuge. There will be some men here that will be up here uh, to, to speak with you, to pray with you. If you have something on your heart, I challenge you to come forward as some of our pastors and others. Come on up. And maybe you, you just want to rededicate your life. You want to give it to God. And we'll have some men and some ladies up here that can pray with you. Don't put it off today. Amen. I surrender all. Let's pray. Lord, we just... Coming before you, we give you all the praise and glory. We, we thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to bring the word. I pray, Lord, that something was said today that someone can understand that they need to have a relationship with you. I pray that some, there was someone here that needs to rededicate their life. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here who would love to join this church, that they come forward as we, at the end of my prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this church and what it stands for, for the word and what we stand on. Lord, we love you and we give you all the praise and glory because we know that the battle is not ours, it's yours. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.